Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, I want to welcome you all, and it's a real pleasure for me to, to uh, invite you uh, to uh, welcome you to the commemoration um, lectures of this of the Great Fire of 1947, and uh, in that process to celebrate the wonderful community spirit that we all love about this place. Um, 
and that helped uh, Jackson Laboratory and also the rest of Mount Desert Island recover from that fire. Um, that same sense of community continues to support us uh, today as we celebrate also the Acadia Centennial, which we'll hear a little bit about. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ed Liu. I'm the president and CEO of the Jackson Laboratory. And I'm delighted uh, that to see uh, both familiar faces and to meet some, some new friends uh, to the Jackson Labs and to the Acadia National Park. Um, uh, this marks the 69th year um, since that great fire in 1947, which damaged parts of Bar Harbor, the Acadia National Park, and, and almost completely destroyed the Jackson Laboratory. Um, our 87-year history in this uh, community has been um, uh, extremely deep and, and greatly embraced by both our, uh, our workforce as well as the community. And uh, the Acadia National Park is part and parcel of this uh, affection that we have for, for this location. The Acadia enriches the lives of our employees, uh, both who reside and work here. Uh, many of our, we are, our, um, our laboratory abuts the national park, and I and others actually take noontime walks uh, into the park itself. Uh, don't tell people that I take that many uh, walks. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but the visitors to the park, along with the communities and business of, of Mount Desert Island, really invigorate our work. Um, I can tell you that this has been one of the reasons why I wanted to come to the Jackson Labs, and this is the reason why uh, this last year we recruited eight new faculty members, and all of them state that the, it's partly the park and the beauty of the park that has attracted them to this, uh, to this location. Um, we have a, a tremendous shared history, uh, and some of that history uh, you'll hear today at nexuses of both um, wonderful moments of, of celebration, like Fourth of July, uh, for those of you who are here, but also in moments of tragedy, mm -hmm. like um, like the fire, not only on 47 but 89 as well. And in each case, um, it's the communities that came together that really allowed us to recover. Now today, I'm uh, I'm honored to introduce our first guest speaker for the evening, somebody who really embodies the sense of community here at Mount Desert Island and who was really the instrumental in planning not only this event, but many of the events for the Centennial. Jack Russell is a co-chair of the Acadia Centennial Task Force and a board member of the Friends of Acadia. Um, he's a dear friend of, and a champion of the Jackson Laboratory and, and clearly a well-respected community member uh, of MDI. Um, uh, Jack was four years old. I think we calculated correctly. Um, <laughs> When the Great Fire of 1947 began, uh, his mother, uh, legendary uh, Elizabeth or Tibby Russell, was a scientist here at that time. Um, Tibby uh, is really um, an icon. Um, you know her her memory, her the stories about Tibby Russell still last to this day. Um, and um, Tibby pioneered bone marrow transplantation in mice, which was the model system of how that was transported and tra and transplantation in humans. Uh, by the way, the whole framework of compatibility of a bone marrow donor was invented here. Um, and uh, George Snell won the Nobel Prize for using the model system so, to show that there are genetic causes for why some people reject um, the uh, transplantations and, uh, from a donor and not from others. Um, and as you will learn, Tibby was not only an uh, instrumental in science, but also very important in rebuilding the institution. Uh, today, Jack is going to begin our program by telling the story of the six-day fire and its impact on the community. Please join us in welcoming Jack Russell. Okay. See if I can turn on my mic. Am I live? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be introduced by Ed Liu. Uh, and I am one of many, many people on Mount Desert Island that is uh, intensely proud and glad that we have had him 
uh, at the helm of the JACs uh, in its extraordinary growth over the last half decade. Uh, I also want to um, toss a bouquet to my friends at Jeff Dobbs Production, who uh, were in the best island tradition, real sharers, uh, allowed me to have a couple of uh, film clips um, from a little lighter down here for good. Um, uh, yeah. um, uh, for uh, the show today. Uh, and I also want to uh, express here my respect and appreciation for the real heroine and producer of this event, which is Heather Hodgkins in the back. Thank you. When, you. when you've done as many centennial events as I have, you know how valuable it is to have somebody whom you figure out, I don't have to worry. Uh, it's going to be done right. Okay. Um, I also want to ask you for a little bit of work. How many of you in this room today were present on Mount Desert Island in October of 1947? A few hands. Okay. Less than I might have guessed, but still, thank you. That's important to know. Uh, I hope uh, that my account... Uh, is uh, consistent with your memory. Uh, you could say that in the 100-year sweep of Acadian history, that one day uh, may not seem consequential, uh, but clearly it was. Uh, October 23rd, 1947, lives changed. Town, lab, and park lost much and took many years to recover. But each of them has risen from the ashes uh, and become globally respected and appreciated and valued resources. And that is our story for this afternoon. Uh, my role is simple. Uh, I'm the guy who gets to convey with images and some words uh, what happened on that week and especially that day. Uh, it is my opportunity to honor the community response. Uh, I will offer a few comments uh, from the complex memory of a four-year-old uh, and one who's listened to family since then. Um, and then I'll pass you on to my betters who will talk about the resilience of town and park and lab over the last seven decades. 69 years ago, October 23rd, 1947, 4 p.m. here in this place, Alan Salisbury knew what was coming and what he must do. Alan was a big man, tall, broad, dark, and down east to his core. Alan had many roles at the Jackson Lab. He was a foreman and also the night caretaker. Uh, he and his wife Florence helped my parents run the summer program. Uh, they lived in the caretaker's cottage on the small Jacks campus. And importantly, Alan took Prexy Little into the Maine woods every year to get his deer. Alan Salisbury was an anchor. On October 23rd, he had already fought the fire for three days. He had helped his Hulls Cove sister get off island and then got Florence and their five-year-old daughter, Nancy, my classmate, to their grandmothers in Trenton. When the wind changed at about 3 o'clock on the afternoon of the 23rd, Alan knew the new danger and his duty. He drove to the lab from the fire lines, oversaw a skeleton mouse room crew, put in food and water for a few days, and then sent the crew either to Bar Harbor or to join the evacuation going south on Route 3 uh, along uh, the long way out toward the bridge. Finally. Alan saved what he could from his own place, his guns, his dogs, his rod, and a good Sunday suit he'd laid out for a rotary meeting. Alan was the last man out. He rushed to the, against the evacuation traffic to Bar Harbor where his mother was still making sandwiches for the firefighters. Soon after Alan left, not long after the last evacuating car passed south, as the smoke-filled sun, smoke choke sun went down, the fire came. It roared down on the lab from the northwest, driven by mighty winds. 
White pines that had stood for a century were torched. The duff burned down to the granite bedrock. All of the buildings exploded in an inferno as 90,000 mice, a precious research dock bred over 30 years, perished in minutes. Great value was destroyed in a few hours. The heat torch cracked apart the stone sign that welcomed the world to the Roscoe B. Jackson Memorial Laboratory. The cracked pieces would stay in the ground, buried for decades, and then be rediscovered during new construction at Jack's. Wise folks rejoined them as a welcome to us all above the hearth at Roscoe's as an emblem of our resilience and a good beginning symbol for our story this afternoon. The contributions that the, the conditions that fueled the Great Fire burdened most of Maine, particularly southern Maine and coastal Maine, in the fall of 1947. A wet spring was followed by a tinder dry summer and fall. By mid-October, fires raged in many places. Big burns rolled over forests and fields. Four of these fires were even larger than the conflagration that we endured here on MDI. The best history of this time is appropriately subtitled, The Week That Maine Burned. The map shows the course of the Great Fire. At the start of that week, MDI watched carefully as a modest fire at Dolliver's Dump on the Crooked Road smoldered. Uh, the town crew was able to confine the fire to about 169 acres from late on the 17th to early on the 21st. But on Tuesday the 21st, Morning winds drove the fire southeast to the north end of Eagle, Echo Lake, Eagle Lake. On the 22nd, winds from the east first burst the fire as a threat westward toward Bar Harbor and Hull's Cove, but shifted to come from the east and drove the fire down the west side of Eagle Lake. On the 23rd, morning winds from the southwest drove the blaze toward Hull's Cove again, but at about 3 p.m., they shifted course to come from the northwest and now at gale force of 60 miles an hour, becoming, driving the conflagration six miles in three hours. 17,300 acres burned, 8,700 of them within Acadia. Here are some images from those harrowing days. When the winds freshened on the morning of the 21st and the j jumped free from Dolliver's dump, it was out of control within minutes. Bar Harbor Fire Chief Dave Sleeper knew that he would need some help and quickly sent out an appeal to the mutual aid towns and to the Army Air Corps at Dow Field in Bangor. Tuesday, the burn down from the north end uh, to the north end of Eagle Lake was a shocking wound that charred 2,000 acres. That evening, my fire, father and new stepmother were among many who wa watched from the Cadillac Mountain Road as the fire claimed McFarland Hill as the dark came. In essays that each of them would write in the week following the fire, they recall seeing the lights flicker along the McFarland Hill Road where my, fire, my father had helped build a ski tow. They first thought that these were the headlights of trucks helping their friends evacuate but then they realized it was actually the arrival of the fire. On the 23rd, as 2,300 more acres burned, some farm homes were lost. The volunteer firefighting was not all centrally directed. Many volunteers uh, went where they thought they could do the most good and did what they could to save their own properties and that of engineers and neighbors. During the week, Perhaps a thousand men fought the fire, and, against orders, at least one woman, my 24-year-old stepmother, who tucked her long hair underneath a cap, pulled on some jeans, and went to work fighting the fire for three days with my father. Given the widely dispersed volunteer force and the speed of the fire, particularly when the winds exploded in the afternoon of the 23rd, it is amazing that no one was lost directly fighting the fire. 
By October 23rd, much of what we were, uh, we were enduring was known across the country. Uh, the aerial photo here uh, surveys uh, the Bar Harbor the morning after as the fire is still smoldering. Uh, a fire dramatized the threat to our town. Out on Forest Street and on hills coming into town, the conflagration rolled into the night. Century pines, loved by four generations, exploded in seconds. How did our community respond to this harrowing ordeal? From my memories as a young child and the stories that I have heard afterwards, folks were very resourceful in the face of growing danger. Remember the times. It was 1947, less than two years after VJ Day. Men had returned from hell, eager for peace. In those post-war years, young families were starting out, seeking to get ahead, proud of buying a new appliance or a good piece of furniture. With the threat of a large fire, they wondered how to protect their best possessions. I personally know people who buried their refrigerators before they evacuated. <laughs> Others figured out another good solution, and the idea spread. The Trenton Airport was open, clear, and public. Runway borders became a good place to wrap and leave a good chair or sofa or bed. Hundreds of pieces of furniture were left along the runways by October 23rd. And here is another image from the Trenton Airport of that time. The main forest fire was front page news on the East Coast. Summer colony people worried about their cottages and their valuables. Some rented DC-3s and hired local people to make sure that their silver, china, and good Bordeaux were lifted to safety. <laughs> Planes rolled down the runways past the rasp wrapped best furniture of year-rounders. Power went out on the island on the 21st, but essential phone communication was maintained. Uh, some young women uh, from the uh, from the island uh, returned, uh, others who work, uh, put in uh, two straight days, 48 hours, manning the switchboards. Once Fire Chief Dave Sleeper sent out his appeal, Maine came. The Army Air Corps mustered from Dow. The men of the Bangor Theological Seminary came. Students from UMO, Bates, Colby, and Bowdoin left classes behind to help on Mount Desert Island. And professional and volunteer crews uh, uh, from the mainland communities came here in force to help us. None of them had seen anything like what they faced here, especially on October 23rd. Many had fought forest fires, of course, but not in gale force winds and not after a six-month drought. Many island firefighters had to hurry home to save what they could from their own homes. Neighbors teamed up, moving from house to house. On the late afternoon of the 23rd, the fire moved down Millionaire's Row along Frenchman's Bay from Hull's Cove to Bar Harbor. The year-round homes of many residents also went up.
By the next morning, a few movies and still photos would show the record of the catastrophe. As the gale force drove flames toward Bar Harbor, the first of two great caravans gathered to escape. The signal was seven blows on the fire station horn. At 4.10 p.m., the call came to evacuate. Route 3 North was, of course, closed by fire. So the route for those who could make it was the long way round on Route 3 via Otter Creek, Seal Harbor, Northeast Harbor, Somesville, and Town Hill. My mother, older brother, and I were part of this exodus in our old 1941 Ford. I remember hundreds of cars bumper to bumper, the gathering dark, the glow of the surging fire, and when we reached the Trenton Bridge, being able to take a long look backwards and see our mountains in flames. I do not recall fear, only that what I saw was my home. We made it safely across to the mainland. Relief for, ref for refugees was coordinated from the Ellsworth Municipal Building, ever after for me a hallowed place. More than 3,000 people must have been cared for there on the 23rd, recorded, comforted, fed, taken to shelter, or bedded down there for the night on a cot as we were. It is, an extraordinary, it is extraordinary what communities can do and quickly when they must. I learned just yesterday that the veterinarian in Ellsworth took in hundreds of animals, large and small, livestock and pets, each brought across by islanders. An Ellsworth farm couple took mom, my brother, and me in for nearly a week after the fire. They were very kind. I remember a big black stove, a big brown dog and great baked beans. I assumed that they would have asked mother about our lives and that mom would have found her way to convey our hard passage in these months. However, this may have been shared. The farmer saw a little boy who had evacuated quickly without toys. Handy with his tools, he cut me a beautiful set of pine blocks, sanded on a, to a fine bevel on the edges, I had them as one way to rebuild my world and understand how much place matters. Back on the island, where the fire raged on to Jackson Lab, it cut off the escape route, Route 3, uh, the long way around. Some 2,500 people still in Bar Harbor came to the athletic field. Women, children, elderly men, pets. National Guardsmen doing what they could. In the crucial moment in the defense of Bar Harbor came late on the afternoon of the 23rd as the fire surged down from the north-northwest. Chief Dave Sleeper decided to make a stand along Eden Street from West Street to the Echo Lake Road. He had hydrant water there and the support of brave men from many other towns. The goal was to block the braze from torching down West Cottage and Mount Desert Streets. If the fire came in a quartering blow, with no shift in the wind, they had a fighting chance. If the wind shifted to come directly from the west, no one knew the fate of the men or our town. Firefighters from Camden and Surrey stood at the corner of West and Eden Streets. Fighters from, fighters from Bucksport and Brewer made their stand along the sweeping corner of Eden and Mount Desert Streets near the Malvern Hotel. As the fire finally surged down on them, they were beaten back to Spring Street as the Malvern burned. But they threw soaked blankets on their shoulders, opened their hoses full fan, marched the fire back, and saved much of our town. As the fire ringed the town, people decided to seek greater safety by the sea 
They marched up Main Street to the town pier, by all accounts in a calm, orderly possession. Imagine what they saw from the pier. The fire was on all flanks of the town in the gathering dark. The great anchor hotels on the west end of town burst into flames. Many knew of the oil and dynamite stores at the Clark Coal Company and worried that they might blow. One of those gathered, Raymond Cars, 51, died of a coronary. Half the people of our town waited calmly until an escape route <coughs> could come. A calm went out for help by sea. The bay was whipped by the gale, but lobstermen from several harbors responded, risking their boats and their lives. The Maine Seacoast Mission deployed their sunbeam to the pier to aid in the sea rescue. All told, in the early evening, some 400 people were carried to safety across water, including the Sisters of Holy Redeemer. The second evacuation was even more harrowing than the first. The fire still burned along parts of Route 3 North, but bulldozers began clearing the road to open a way. The 2,000-some people still on the pier boarded trucks, mostly from Dow, and sprawled out uh, and, and crawled out toward the bridge. A tragic accident on the bluffs hail, halted the escape for a while uh, when one truck rear-ended another. Two lost their lives. One was Walter Coates, an airman from Dow. The other was Helen Cormier, a student at Bar Harbor High, who was sitting with her mother and younger sister near the rear of the back uh, truck that was rammed. She was thrown from the truck and suffered a fractured skull. <coughs> she died that Saturday at the Ellsworth Hostel. Helen Cormier was 16 and by many accounts a beautiful and intelligent young woman. She would have been 65 this, 85 this year. Perhaps she would have joined us today with her survivor's story. She rests now at Holy Redeemer Cemetery. The nation and then the world became aware of our agony. For a few days, we were front page above the fold. The loss of property was crushing. The Great Fire of 1947 destroyed 69 summer cottages, 170 rear round homes, and five hotels. Bar Harbor would never be the same. In the hard light of that late October weekend, we saw the loss. All of Bar Harbor over Hamilton's Hill, out by the golf course, was simply gone. Sir Demont, the pride of George B. Dore, was a charred ruin. The smoldering shell of the Malvern Hotel was a grim evidence of the hard way ahead for us, but was still also, as soon everybody would know, the place where heroism of fighters had done the most to save what we could and preserve a community from which we could rebuild. If you will allow, I'll speak of the loss at the Jackson Lab in personal family words. Two hours after Alan Salisbury left the campus on the 23rd, it was an exploded smoking ruin. That afternoon, probably after Alan left, my father and stepmother foolishly tried to reach the lab to save what they could of their research records. These records were their door to their future. Uh, they were waiting on security clearances to begin their work at Oak Ridge. On the 23rd, when the wind changed, they left their fire lines and drove the long way around toward the lab, coming up Route 3 from Otter Creek to the, 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 against the flow of the first evacuation, including our old Ford, headed the other way. I may have come within a half mile of the lab on the Schooner Head Road before embers started falling on their car and they turned to flee south. They might easily have become the fifth and sixth fatalities. They finally got off island for a few fitful hours of sleep and then used my father's title doctor as a ruse to get back on island the next morning. They drove to the lab where a few military and some workers uh, had, who had not evacuated, uh, were probing what remained. These good men rigged a ladder so that my father could get up 
to the still smoking ruins of his second floor office and find what was left of his cabinets and pull open a drawer with irrational hope. He found the record of 10 years of research in ashes. <coughs> the first voice to call of rebuilding from these ashes was Jackson Lab founder and CEO Clarence Cook Little, proxy to all who knew him then. The lab was a big employer on Ireland. Prexy was a major national player in the circles at work on establishing the infrastructure for post-World War II science in America. He could have taken the Jacks brand anywhere. Prexy did not hesitate. By that weekend, he had told the world and our community, of course we will rebuild. Within weeks, plans were falling into place to rebuild the lab buildings the mouse research docs, and the scientific role of the Jackson Lab. His confident voice <coughs> turned us toward resilience. One last image, if I may, uh, to balance that of the DC-3s flying off with the good Bordeaux. Some 170 MDI residents lost their homes in the fire. Not summer cottages, homes. Many were not insured. Quietly, through the grace of a year-round summer person, all were contacted and told that they would be held whole for the loss of their homes. This was not done, this was done anonymously. There was no fanfare. Just life the way life is supposed to be. Since 1947, no matter where I lived, I always was aware of where home was and what real community meant. In the weeks following the Great Fire of 1947, our communities had turned to the work that lay ahead, the resilience of town, park, and lab. Thank you. For those of you who know Jack, you know he's a professional historian, uh, and so his professional training surely showed in his uh, delicious narrative uh, about this event. Um, how he wove a story of a disaster that turned into a blessing and uh, one of, of, of community. Um, uh, thank you, thank you very, very much, Jack. I can say Ken Burns, move over. <laughs> our next two speakers are also well known in our community and they will be sharing their, their thoughts and their experiences at this event. Sandy McFarland is no stranger to uh, not only our MDI community but our Jackson Labs community. Uh, Sandy is an eighth generation McFarland in Bar Harbor, Maine. That's pretty good. His family has resided on this island since um, 17, in the 1760s. Um, and we at Jack's, however, really are extremely fortunate to call him a member of our management staff um, for which he had, had uh, worked for 45 years. Um, uh, as an aside, uh, one of the first tasks I did uh, coming to the Jackson Labs five years ago was to, was to participate in the summer um, luncheon that we have for our 20 year plus veterans of the Jackson Labs. And I was, I was actually astonished. I've never been in an organization where there were so many individuals that have been here 20, 30, and 40 years. And I kind of a back of the envelope calculated that the, that the cumulative experience in this room, and this is a very large room, um, uh, was about 4,500 years, which was, um, I have to admit, which uh, actually I, I commented that that was the uh, equivalent to the, to the history, um, to the length of historical man, you know, where the historical records are. So it's really quite <coughs> remarkable. Sandy served on many boards and in um, many varying roles on the Bar Harbor School Board, the Congregational Church, YMCA, member of the Bar Harbor Town Council for three years and a 45-year mem member of the National Ski Patrol. Are you still doing that? 
You sort of, yeah, okay, um, this is remarkable. Um, Sandy currently is a board member of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society and a Commodore at the Bar Harbor Yacht Club, um, which I had the honor of, of touring at one point. Sandy and his wife, Karen, uh, try, try to be out hiking, boating, biking, uh, almost daily, and I think cannot imagine another lifestyle. Joining Sandy will be Jill Goldwaith, who is um, a great friend um, and no stranger to the community. I came here as a registered nurse, and the story that she had was remarkable. Just put her child in and just drove to Bar Harbor, and a mem and and really began to um, to to not only be part of the community but also lead the community as a chair of the Bar Harbor Town Council for many years and a Maine senator for eight. Um, we at Jacks were very lucky to call Jill our director for government relations for many years, and um, I had a privilege of working with her. Uh, before her retirement, and uh, she actually was the person who, who gave, uh, gave my wife a tour and, uh, uh, and w while we were looking at this job. Uh, Jill is also an award-winning weekly political columnist, and many of you have read, and I certainly <coughs> read her columns at the Ellsworth American and Mount Desert Islander, and she also serves on the board of the Maine Seacoast Mission and the Friends of Acadia. Uh, this evening, Sandy and Jill will give us an overview of the rebuilding and the development of Bar Harbor after the fire. Please welcome them. Thank you, Dr. Liu. To start off with, um, I had my 10th birthday on October 22nd, 1947. Oh. <clears throat> it was a roasting time. <laughs> As to what I remember, I don't remember too much about the build-up of the fire. Uh, it was kind of exciting, fire engines running around and everything. But uh, I remember more vividly the night of the fire and the evacuation, because um, it was like the 4th of July down by the pier. And that's when the town had connected to decide to what do th there's some talk about the Navy sending in some ships and uh, a few lobster boats arrived but um, finally um, they decided to as, they, as Jack mentioned uh, open the road up route 3 and um, my father happened to be on the um, a selectman and it didn't have a town council here as a selectman and they, we were all gathered down where the motor inn is now on the the end of that used to be the old Barbie Yacht Club uh, reading room, and uh, it was cold, miserable night. So he finally said, "Well, uh, told the police to go ahead and you take responsibility, break the door down, so people could get inside and uh, stay warm." And uh, finally, we got into the cars and and left uh, on Route Three, and um, they up by the bluffs they had some fire engines. And they were wetting the cars down to uh, go through the fire line. And then we went over and stayed in uh, in Ellsworth with some relatives there. But the next day, because my father was on the council, he came back because they had to sign passes for people to get back into Bar Harbor because it was under under the control of the National Guard. And so I got to go back with him. And um, and actually, one of the uh, so I stayed around the town office with him and and. Um, there was a National Guard there, and they had to go I get where, was, where they wanted to go, and they didn't know how to get there. So my father said, take him. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that was, that was an interesting time. But then as far as the terms of recovery, um, I guess I'll divert a little bit from, you've already heard all the tragedies of the fire from, from Jack. But it was also, a, I think, a change agent for Bar Harbor. And, um, mm -hmm. and the change agent created opportunities for Bar Harbor. And, um, and that's, we began tourism. So a group of uh, local business people, uh, my father, Bob Kinney, who used to be uh, head of North Atlantic Packing, became uh, chairman of the board of General Mills, but he was in Bar Harbor then. They got together and they issued stock and they built the hotel to encourage tourism to come to Bar Harbor. So that was really the, the beginning of that transition to these large summer homes and um, to what we see today. 
And um, so that was a, 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 a brave move on their part when everything else was pretty much desolate around here. And then I remember just being around watching the cleanup of uh, Mr. Rockefeller subsidized a lot of that. Arnold Allen, over in Stonesville, had a sawmill, so he cleaned a lot of the forest. Mr. Rockefeller, which actually turned over to the National Park. And um, so then the business recovery started. I mean, there was just uh, so little going on. The way of life had changed and uh, for so many people here. But th then I see that, that there's two great fires. So I remember the first fire, I remember, is the burning of the Congregational Church, uh, four years old. And um, that was kind of exciting, because I stood on the front porch of my mother, and, and that's when the bell from the steeple rolled down School Street. <laughs> and uh, but then I can fast forward to uh, 89, and the fire here at the Jackson Laboratory. And it's interesting that, that in, in those two great fires, the, the uh, 47 fire and the 89 fire, there were crucial people in the right place at the right time. The first one was Prexy Little, the other one was Ken Pagan. And uh, I wasn't there when Prexy uh, got everything moving, but I was there with Ken the night in the, in the staff conference room and he just, uh, we went to the airport in Bangor and had him come back because he was flying to California. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, he sat there and assigned duties of what people were going to do. And, uh, and he says, well, it's a fire. He says, there'll probably be another one. But what we have is an opportunity to seize. And he did. And that was uh, really the seed of the, the beginning the growth of the Jackson Laboratory, not only in just in buildings and size and mouse sales, but in, in research efforts as well, because he started a, a fantastic recruiting program basically around the world. And uh, so that's, to me, that's a seed of what it is, and it really was a change agent for the laboratory, because there were people that wanted after, when Prexy's time, to move the the laboratory to Long Island or somewhere where they could raise money and be close to other research centers. And uh, practically put his foot down. By the way, he's one of my Sunday school teachers. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, but Ken did the same thing. He seized the opportunity and uh, the one to put people back to work and to get back doing research. And um, so I. Uh, I think that, that it was a change agent. The laboratory started to grow, and um, to me, the, 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 uh, the time of the 89 fire was a, probably the most exciting time a manager could ever have. And um, interesting, I don't think that uh, probably even Dr. Lou knows that when the, when the laboratory burned in 47, Unit 3 was under construction, and that was the only part of the laboratory that was insured because they had a trustee that thought insurance companies were a bunch of crooks and he wouldn't let the laboratory buy insurance. But they still persevered and, and came back. In 89, uh, we were in much better shape financially and, and uh, insurance-wise, and um, so that survived it well. So there's two outstanding people in the right place at the right time. And I think uh, my good good partner Jill can pick up from there. Well, it's a pleasure to see so much <coughs> excuse me, so much interest in this event that happened a long time ago but still has um, a real imprint on the nature and the psychology of our community as well. If the fire of 47 was a demarcation between summer people and tourists, the transition to a new economy began in earnest around the late 70s. You've heard Sandy describe how it was a change agent. That was the point where Bar Harbor started to get serious about managing the benefits and impacts of transient visitors as opposed to the summer residents. I moved here at about that point in 1978. In many ways, the village is still the same. The commercial activity is still centered in pretty much the same area. There's been a little bit of development on Main Street, moving out toward Lower Main Street, but basically confined to the same area. 
Um, in the mid-70s, the town set to work on management of the various impacts as a result of this new economy in town. And we were hard at work on growth management. Thousands of hours were spent on zoning ordinances, a comprehensive plan. And it was pretty much a volunteer effort, of which I am one guilty party at that point. It was done mostly by volunteers. Um, the downsides were that, as they said in Love Story, love means never having to say you're sorry. We didn't want to say we were sorry to anybody when we planned growth. So everything that was happening was allowed to happen wherever it was happening. And then we tried to build a little management around that. Uh, the other problem was that those documents over time did not stand up all that well to attorneys who came in representing some of the bigger developers. As far as lodging goes, a number of motels were built. Uh, but there was also a B&B boom in the 80s, and the conversion to bed and breakfast helped to preserve the cottages that had survived the fire because they needed some kind of an income to keep a building of that uh, size and built so long ago in operation. Um, smaller B&Bs also became a source of overnight rooms in the off season. They were able to stay open during the winter when the bigger places could not. Next was the arrival of larger hotels and resort hotels that dwarfed all previous lodging. Uh, the growing pains, including the scale of some of these operations, which seemed a bit outsized to those of us who'd been around for a while. And uh, also the consolidation of ownership into uh, fewer hands and the worry that if anything happened to that owner, uh, that was going to be a difficult challenge for the town to meet. We also have our floating hotels, the cruise ships. Some of them have more passengers than the town has residents. When I moved here, there were about 4,200 people. Now there are about 5,200, so the town has grown some. But some of these ships carry more passengers than that. They don't bring any cars. That's a good thing. They're gone by 4 o'clock. That might be a good thing, too. Um, <laughs> But there are more people that come ashore than we can sometimes manage comfortably, especially when there's more than one ship in a day. We worry about water quality issues, uh, very large buses that are not quite comfortable on the small streets of our village area, uh, potential interference with what's left of our fishing community. So that's a mixed blessing that we're looking at now. Restaurants, we have more of them. You can get Thai food, Mexican food, Chinese food. This is wonderful. This did not happen 40, 50 years ago. Craft beers, coffee shops. What do we have, five or six coffee shops in uh, Bar House? Everybody can get their fix. And uh, one of them is not the you know what brand. That's good. Um, some of these places stay open in the winter. We are eternally grateful for them doing that. One of the growing pains on the restaurant side is food waste management. It's very difficult to get rid of what is the residue from a busy restaurant operation by the end of an evening in town. As far as the retail service, um, we had stores like Butterfields, Wards, Adler's, where you could buy, pardon me, but ladies' underwear. You could buy white pants for your kid to march in the Memorial Day Parade. Now we have fewer of the stores that service a year-round industry, but plenty more who figured out that T-shirts and refrigerator magnets were the way to go. <laughs> Some of the early businesses are still with us. Uh, we have Jordan's down next to um, the Don's, I still call it. Uh, the West End, Sherman's, Testa's, even Deba's. There's a young woman who grew up here, and she was asked one of those um, interview questions that you see on the front page of this section. And they said, what's your favorite p place on Mount Desert Island? And she said, I know I'm supposed to say somewhere in the park, but really it's Sherman's. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the 90s, we started uh, the shoulder season promotion. Snow is helpful for that cause because the cross-country skiing is great here when there's snow. But we also now have pajama day and the bed races. We've got midnight madness. Um, sometimes we have winter carnival, depending on the year and the, the weather. Um, in the early 80s, we started struggling with the increase in retail versus to the desire to main some, maintain some kind of aesthetic standards for visitors and residents alike. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so not everyone agreed on just what those standards should be. Should we have uh, more regulation? Should we have signs? At one point, we had a no flashing, no fluttering, no moving restriction on signs in the businesses. 
Uh, we had an interesting debate about indoor, outdoor merchandise. We started off no outdoor merchandise, and somebody said, well, what about Morang's cars? No, we didn't mean that. Well, what about the hardware store that had lawnmowers outside? No, we didn't mean that. <laughs> well, what about the bicycle shop with the rack of bikes on cottage? No, we didn't mean that. We knew what we wanted town to look like, but it was very hard to figure out how to say it. Is a porch indoors or outdoors? Is an open bay window indoors or outdoors? These things get very complicated. Traffic and parking. Do we have to say any more about that? Uh, we had a one-way parking scheme in the late 80s. We had done a, an elaborate study with the help of an engineer from Boston, if you can believe it. And uh, we changed Cottage Street to one way up, West Street, uh, sorry, Main Street down to West Street one way and then out west. Everybody hated it, but we had spent enough on the study so that the chairman of the town council, yes, it was me, said we are not changing this for a year because some of this might just be we're not used to it. We kept it for a year. Everybody still hated it. It's gone. <coughs> we are now looking at a parking garage, although that's been put somewhat on the back burner. We're looking in the closer term at parking meters in the downtown. We have to sort out all the elements of will they fit on the sidewalk, what about the plow, how much should we charge, do residents have to pay, what about the residential areas where people live. So that also is a complicated question. I want to make a footnote about the Jackson Laboratory. I was lucky enough to work here for almost 10 years. It's an amazing place. The importance of Jacks to stay on after the, both fires cannot be overestimated. There are over 1,300 jobs here. Imagine. They have, uh, they're well paid, they have great benefits, there is career development opportunities here. Any other town would kill for these jobs. This is the largest repository of mouse models of human disease on the planet. And not just any model, but the absolute most advanced, most refined models. There are over 6,000 strains of mouse models here. It's quite extraordinary. Do you know what these people can do? They can freeze mouse sperm, don't ask how they get it, <laughs> and then when it's needed to develop a model, they take it out of the freezer, pop it in the microwave or somehow warm it back up <laughs> and can breed live mice from that. When we first developed that, no one else in the world knew how to do that. But what do we say? Ah, I could not get out of my driveway yesterday because of the lamb traffic. So, chill everybody. This is a fabulous place. We're so lucky to have it here. Um, <clears throat> to continue, we're now feeling the effects of the successful conversion to being the capital of Vacation Lab. We are the velveteen <coughs> rabbit of Maine. All our fur is being loved off. We have a daytime population of about 20,000 people in the summer. That makes us Maine's ninth biggest city. Our sidewalks are impassable between ice cream eaters, photo takers, and dogs and strollers. It's very difficult to move around. It's terribly difficult if you're in a wheelchair. It's really almost not navigable anymore, and that's not a good thing. The streets are congested. The DOT tells us we have a traffic light in our future at the corner of Mount Desert and Eden Streets. I'm sorry to see that. Many people have abandoned bicycling in town. It's just too dangerous because all those drivers are on their cell phones, right? Um, parking was insane in the last two years. Cars were flooding residential areas and getting very creative about just where they parked. Uh, we have what I call the 4th of July flush. We've got 40,000 people trying to flush a toilet at about the same time on the 4th of July. We have, uh, on the 5th of July, we experienced the life-changing magic of tidying up after those 50,000 people. Thank you, Public Works Department. We look beautiful by 8 o'clock in the morning on the 5th of July. Public safety, the fire persuaded us to maintain a larger fire department than most rural main towns. Uh, the number of visitors and the amount of personal property to be protected uh, provide a continuing need for police and fire protection and EMS to rec uh, rescue us from our bad luck or our bad decisions. We could have lost downtown Bar Harbor in the winter of 2014. There was a brilliant stop by the Bar Harbor Fire Department and the other island fire departments who came to help on Cottage Street, we lost one building, the building that caught fire, and the two on either side of it were literally inches away. Thank you, Bar Harbor Fire Department and Police Department. Uh, housing is so valuable for summer rentals now that there's no place for employees to live. Bigger enterprises can provide employee housing, but there are conflicts in the neighborhoods with that. 
and local housing s stock is transitioning to summer rentals, so year -round, the year-round resident population in the village is dwindling. It's going to be harder for year-round businesses to stay open in the winter, too, and we are so grateful that a number of them do. Where do we go from here? Should we build a parking garage? Where will we get the workforce to support more visitors and an expanded season? Where will we house those people? Can we develop affordable year-round housing? What are the transportation options for residents and visitors? Should we have a pedestrian downtown? The fire recovery is long complete. The question now is how much is too much? Thank you. <laughs> That was absolutely stunning. Um, let me let me update you on a few of the figures. She um, Jill said there were six thousand uh, mouse strains. There are nine nine thousand, uh, and it just shows you our, our you know our growth. And we're uh, we're very pleased that in the last ten years um, the institution has grown by just the sheer numbers, one hundred and thirty eight percent. So you won't find a place that would um, that would have that kind of growth. Um, now, uh, for, first of all, I just want to thank both Jill and Sandy for, for just really uh, wonderful and personal presentations. So how did the Acadia National Park survive uh, 8,750 acres of forest burning to become one of America's most cherished national parks? Today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Kevin Schneider, superintendent of the Acadia National Park and the um, and this uh, St. Crow um, Island International Historic Site to answer these uh, questions for us. Kevin uh, is an 18-year veteran of the National Park Service, and before taking his current post, which was very recent, he was deputy uh, superintendent at the Grand Teton National Park and the J.D. Rockefeller Memorial Parkway located in Wyoming. It's a beautiful place for those who have not been there. Uh, Kevin earned an um, honor award for outstanding service uh, from the Department of Justice Assistant Attorney General in 2005 and received the uh, Department of the Interior Superior Service Award in 2004. It's really my pleasure to welcome Kevin today. Thank you for inviting me to celebrate Acadia's centennial and to be with you all today to commemorate the, the 1947 uh, fire. Uh, it's an honor to be with you. I wanted to start by recognizing Becky Cole Will, who's our Chief of Natural and Cultural Resources at Acadia National Park. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for being here, Becky. And if you have any really tough questions, it's Becky that's probably the one that I'm going to that I'm going to point to. As, as most of you know, I have not been part of this community or landscape for a very long time, uh, less than a year. Uh, others can and have provided uh, much more insight on the specific details of the largest fire in the history of Acadia National Park and Mount Desert Island. Uh, I was, however, in Yellowstone <laughs> National Park during the recovery uh, of that park and that ecosystem after the largest fires there, the Yellowstone fires of 1988. Uh, like here at, at Acadia, those fires burned about one-third of park lands and dramatically affected the ecology of the place. The Yellowstone fires also significantly influenced national fire policies and practices that followed. It ushered in an era of including fire as an integral part of the natural landscapes and many of our nation's uh, forest types. Both fires here at Yellowstone and both fires here at Acadia and in Yellowstone provided excellent opportunities to conduct scientific studies to increase our understanding of fire ecology and fire effects. And so my content, comments are framed in that, that experience and with that perspective uh, that I hope to focus a little bit on the historical context and how it has changed over time and speculate a little bit about the future. I'll share with you some photos and records from the park's archives about the recovery efforts. I'd also like to focus on looking forward uh, to the next century and to the science that is the foundation of future fire and land management. 
Let's consider what history can tell us about managing National Park Service lands as we enter our second century of stewardship. I'll take a stab at what I think will be important to prevent a recurrence, how we can encourage ecological and community resiliency, and the importance of working together as we tackle our second 100 years. And hopefully we can advance our slides. There's always more than one way to skin a cat. After the Acadia fires of 1947, uh, Park Service foresters out of Region 1, based in Richmond, Virginia, were among the first overhead to be flown in, and afterwards produced a comprehensive official record of the fire that was completed in February of 1948. That report and the park's archives of historic photos help us understand the context of the fire. Fire condition reports based on local fuel moisture and weather conditions were issued daily during the fire season in 1947. Even in 1947, there was an extensive network of roads and trails to provide firefighter access and fire breaks, an ample supply of water from the many lakes and ponds, a well-stocked cache of equipment, including a truck, pumps, and hoses, plus supplies sufficient to equip 200 firefighters. The park's two fire towers, Beach Mountain and Sargent Mountain, were staffed during periods of high fire danger and the Beach Mountain Tower even had telephone service. I'm not sure if you can get a cell signal there these days. <laughs> the park and communities had an island-wide fire plan, which outlined areas of responsibility for initial attack. And while there were no formal uh, agreements like we have today, verbal agreements and handshakes ensured a team response <laughs> effort whenever a fire was reported. Generally speaking, well-managed forests were clean and tidy, reflecting a European forestry tradition. With two civilian conservation corps uh, camps on MDI, a large labor force had, over a period of 10 years, done a huge amount of understory clearing and hazard tree removal, fuel reduction, uh, and built an extensive system of, of fire breaks across the island. Likewise, private property owners, namely John D. Rockefeller Jr., used a large labor force to do the same on their lands. Charles E. Peterson, in a 1988 interview, discussed Mr. Rockefeller's attitude towards fallen trees and branches adjacent to the roadside. Quote, he was a very neat person. They say he had a whole team of German foresters and that after a storm they would rush out and pick up every stick. <laughs> the fire response team was trained and well outfitted. One of the three park rangers served as fire chief and there were two fire control aides who worked two to four and a half months depending on fuel conditions and that staffed the towers during peak fire danger. The average year, year, yearly park fire budget was $847. In May of 1947, a three-day fire response training was conducted in Acadia, attended by 29 National Park Service and local cooperating personnel. It focused on teaching power pumps, hoses, and using the abundant sources of water found on MDI. In recognition that people caused most wildland fires nationwide, and all fires up to that point on MDI, one of the most successful advertising campaigns had begun, Smokey Bear. Due to the lack of rain in 1947, MDI was under a no-burn policy, fire towers were staffed, and regular patrols were in place. In a nutshell, the park was as well prepared as it possibly could have been in 1947. But the lesson learned is that all of those prevention and response efforts could do little in the face of nature. This map shows the progression of fire from ignition, green to yellow to orange to red. We now know based on several studies of lake sediment cores that go back to the glacial period that this fire was a highly unusual event, a perfect storm of human ignition, drought, soil, geology, fuels, and not one but two weather events that combined to favor persistent fire that was difficult to extinguish and spread rapidly. Compared to the communities, the park had less burnable infrastructure and only lost 14 buildings. But damage to park roads, trails, and bridges was extensive. Major facilities such as the Spring House at Sertimont were rebuilt by 1949. Despite a National Park Service mandate to preserve resources unimpaired, that is to allow natural processes to proceed, forest management at the time was in the context of two World War efforts 
and forestry practices were geared towards timber production rather than ecological value. This is reflected in the fire report that conservatively estimates that $337,000 was lost in the commercial value of timber. In today's dollars, that's $3.6 million. The term ecology hadn't even been coined in 1947. And as in Yellowstone and most natural fires, the intensity of the fire varied greatly and left behind a complex mosaic of conditions. The degree of burn was the result of the type of fire, crown fire, surface fire, or ground fire, which is fire in roots below the ground subject to reigniting surface fuels. Also influencing the recovery of the forests are how many times the area burned, and most importantly, the characteristics of forest stand and structure. Winter storms after the fire caused blowdowns that made it near, nearly impossible to w even walk through the forest. Two cleanup or timber salvage crews were formed, one government and one private, funded mostly by the Rockefeller family. Almost $200,000 was requested of Washington for forest cleanup by park crews, and another $50,000 for replanting. New Superintendent Benjamin Hadley certainly had his hands full. These crews worked for over three years, mostly near roads and trails. Post-fire recovery efforts of a fire that occurs today are going to be vastly different than the cleanup efforts uh, after the 1947 fire. We have learned that cleanup efforts that can have as much effect, if not even more adverse effects, on the landscapes and forest health and water quality than the fires themselves. One of the first things that would happen today is a burned area emergency response team would be called in, consisting of expertise from an out around the nation. That They would produce a, a rehabilitation plan that would address erosion, noxious weeds, and protection of structures and property. Then, as today, we know that only a fraction, less than 5% of all wildland fires in and near Acadia National Park are caused by lightning. We also know that almost all fires are immediately extinguished uh, before they spread to more than one acre in size. In the park's first century, the second largest fire was 44 acres on Long Island in Blue Hill Bay. It and the fire of 1947 were the only fires on MDI over 10 acres in the last century. This picture is looking north to Eagle Lake from the summit of North Bubble Mountain, where timber was salvaged and fine fuels and small trees were left. This is a burned area treatment along Eagle Lake Road. And this is looking towards Aunt Betty Pond. Today, stumps of the salvaged trees can still be found in Acadia's forests, silent testament to the recovery efforts. This is a log boom in, in what we think is Eagle Lake of timber salvaged for sale. The 1948 report sta states that, one, that following one growing season, many areas within the burned area showed tremendous regeneration. Both here and at Yellowstone, we've learned that nature has an amazing ability to recover from fire. There has been much research and long-term monitoring of how Acadia's forests recovered after the fire even after the, this massive cleanup, cleanup effort that probably hurt forest health by removing coarse woody debris, recent studies have found that Acadia preserve, preserves forests that are regionally significant ecologically, and in contrast to forests on surrounding private lands. Acadia's forests have a higher density of large trees, greater diversity, more coarse woody debris, and less mortality than forests outside the park. We know that disturbance in maintaining is important in maintaining healthy forests, but natural fire is rare in coastal Maine woods. Scientific research to look at sediment cores in lakes from, for charcoal layers show that frequency of fire was greater than 500 years in recurrence at the Bull and Lakewood Pond. Fire frequency was even longer at Skudik, every 1,000 to 3,000 years. The Bar Harbor of fire of 1947 is the only fire of great magnitude in terms of intensity and geographic scale captured in sediment cores from Mount Desert Island, from Isle of Ho, and Skudik. This means that this event is unique in the time frame since the glaciers retreated. 
The science of forest ecology and the science that supports management decisions at Acadia National Park have fundamentally changed since the late 1940s. We now know that a messy forest is much healthier than a clean one. Even Mr. Rockefeller's German foresters that manicured the landscape couldn't prevent this fire. National parks are not in the business to produce timber. So again, national parks are extremely important for science because they represent a control and for comparisons to forests outside uh, the park for other purposes. Unlike Yellowstone, we know that fire here at Acadia is almost always human caused. And also unlike Yellowstone, there are no forest stands here, even pitch and jack pine, that require fire to reproduce. This is the Otter Point Road in 1934. Note the open vistas and views before the fire. Vegetation grew, regrew rapidly after the fire, uh, and we needed to manage Acadia's vistas. Ten years after the fire of 1947, 71 designated roadside vistas were formally identified. They had grown in after the fire and needed to be cleared. This picture illustrates how we need to manage vistas. This is the same view of Ocean Drive on, in 2012 on the left and right with the historic view superimposed in the center. We are now again cutting and clearing vistas on the motor roads and carriage roads. Climate change is also occurring now and Acadia is expected to get warmer. By 2080, we expect temperatures to increase between four and a half and 10 degrees Fahrenheit here. But it is also expected to get wetter between five and seven and a half inches more of more precipitation in the next 25 years. This is also in contrast with Yellowstone in the American West, where in most cases climate change will cause much drier conditions with greater fire intensity. Extreme rainfall events that used to occur every 50 years now occur every 12 years and may increase in frequency in the future. Today at Acadia, we manage wildland fires by suppressing them. We are fortunate to have a full-time fire management officer and several full-time summer seasonal wildland firefighters. We also have access to helicopters and initial attack resources that were not available in 1947. While a repeat of the fire of 47 is extraordinarily unlikely, we as a community can do all our part to reduce the chances of a wildfire. The park will continue to have strong alliances with local fire and response agencies in the communities, the state, and nationally. We will continue our step-up plan, escalating resources during periods of high fire danger. An updated spatial fire management plan will be used to analyze the effects of a more robust fuels reduction program aimed at strategic portions of the park. There is also a fire history study underway that will help us understand our hazardous wildland fuel loading uh, and help with fuels treatment implementation decisions. Homeowners can do more than anyone else to protect their properties by managing vegetation adjacent to structures to make their property more resilient to wildland fire and make it easier for firefighters to protect their structures. An example of this is Baker Island. These pictures show before and after fuels reduction work around the historic lighthouse complex. This kind of work creates more defensible space for firefighters. FireWise is a national program that emphasizes community, in, community involvement and provides inf important information for residents to reduce the risk of wildland fire igniting homes. A FireWise program is underway at Acadia, working with the Maine Forest Service, Mount Desert Island Fire Department, and the Bar Harbor Fire Department. The Maine Forest Service will produce community wildfire protection plans for towns on MDI. Acadia is a strong and resilient place. We have great partners, neighbors, communities. We know that the fire of 1947 was an extremely unusual event on an intensity and scale not found in the sediment record over thousands of years since the glaciers retreated. Fire ecologists have learned many lessons from fires like those at Acadia and Yellowstone. Science and technology are giving us more information on which to base sound management decisions and new technologies help us to respond to fire. As the second century of our stewardship at Acadia National Park dawns, we will build, up, build on the past. We're gonna use science uh, and work together to continue to build our resilience in both our communities as well as our environment. Thank you so much for having me here today.
it's certainly an astonishing um, discussion about how science is now permeating the entire management of the um, of the national park system and how uh, science is so important in that endeavor. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin, and it, we're 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 so honored to have your stewardship in this uh, wonderful jewel of Acadia National Park. As the fire really devastated the town of Bar Harbor and really uh, it had an impact on on Acadia National Park. Um, needless to say, it had a huge impact on Jackson Labs, as as you know Jack had mentioned to you. Um, the the commitment of C.C. Little uh, to stay in um, in Bar Harbor was really a um, a very important piece in our history, um, and that started the the second layer of roots that we have here that um, uh, makes us almost a permanent fixture of uh, of this uh, terrain. Uh, so much so that we're actually extending our our connectivity to Ellsworth. Um, as you may have heard, we are um, starting a new production facility that will be at the end of this $150 million uh, commitment um, to um, the expansion of our, of our work. Um, the the fin financial and moral support that we had after the 1947 fire was really astounding. And we recapitulated, it was mentioned in the 1989 um, uh, fire, which by the way, Ken and Bev Pagan is actually in the other room watching this at this time. And in Roscoe, I hope you'll be able to talk to him. He was indeed transformative, um, as, yeah, as was mentioned um, uh, in, in the history of the Jackson Labs. The financial support at that time uh, amounted to about $483,000 by the, national can the nascent um, National Cancer S Institute at that time, American Cancer Society, Maine Cancer Society, Damon Runyon Foundation, uh, and included um, $123,000 from the Jackson, Roscoe B. Jackson, and the Weber families. Now that's about $600,000 in those days, which really accounts for about $6.6 .6 million dollars in today's dollars. Um, um, the Ladies Auxiliary of the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars provided support for the new library and began a long-standing association between that organization and the Jackson Laboratory. Um, equally important um, is actually the return of what we call breeding pairs of these very precious resources from all the individuals that received our mice over the years prior to 1947. And that was how Jackson Laboratory uh, um, restocked and restarted its, its uh, entire um, uh, program. T.B. Russell led efforts to rebuild the inbred nucleus of the mouse stocks with the assistance of, of the scientists from all over the world. Um, and, um, and this was the basis of the rebuilding. Now, I want to digress a little bit and talk to you a little bit about um, our science because it's really important for you to know why the mouse is so important, so critical to biomedical sciences. The mouse and human separated from each other um, as a species about 65 to 70 million years ago. But in the blueprint that God gave us, um, there's an imprint of that in the mouse. We are about 95% identical in terms of certain sequences and in terms of the structure. And basically our organs are exactly the same. So the mouse is the beautiful model of the human condition. Now there are other models for, for experimentation for human disease, but the mouse has become mainly due to the work of Jackson Laboratory and the founders that's, uh, that began here, uh, became the preferred experimental animal in biomedical sciences. Now, why do you need that? Um, there's been talk about, you know, you can use cell lines, you can just use com computational modeling. That is just simply not true. Not true at all. Um, one needs to have, uh, in all cases, um, because of the complexity of the genome, there's no way for us to compute why one change in, your, in the nucleotides of your genetic blueprint is going to have an impact. It has to be tested in successively in <coughs> in cell lines and also in animals. Um, and over the years, the tools that we have to engineer the mouse genome and to interrogate its physiology is so powerful that it's the preferred model for human disease. 
Now, you, one could argue that we could just simply do experiments on, on humans. Well, I'm, I beg to differ. I'm a physician, and we, we are very, very careful about the questions we ask um, to the volunteers that so gracefully and gratefully um, uh, submit um, um, to, to these um, to, to clinical trials. But take an example of aging. Um, you cannot do a clinical trial in aging in a, human, in a human condition unless you have a long view of a thousand years of looking at experiments. Mm -hmm. yeah, your lifespan is uh, growing and it's 75 to 80 years of age. The mouse is two years, an average lifespan. And so you can imagine that that is the only animal that we can do uh, aging experiments, among others, Alzheimer's. Uh, cardiovascular disease. They're all organ systems. And the Jackson Labs is really the key to, uh, to all that. Um, uh, it was mentioned that there were, um, at that time, there were, you know, uh, several a hundred to a th uh, several, I mean, several thousand um, mice that were housed here during the fire, maybe tens of thousands. Um, today, we have 1.5 million resident mice in, at Jackson Labs, far more than individuals, even tourists that come. Uh, <laughs> um, they, 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 um, they live a, a very, um, very uh, unique life. They are fed beautiful uh, conditions, quite frankly. Um, they're, um, they uh, are free of contagion uh, that we know of, and our veterinarians take very special care of them. Now, um, we as, as scientists really um, are, are very um, serious about our stewardship uh, of other living creatures. Um, we have one of the most stringent um, uh, care protocols here. We, don't we do not breach any violations of ethics in, in, in the animals, and we're very proud of that, uh, of that history. Um, just as much as, as we are stewards of the national park, stewards of the national park. And we don't lord over them, but we have to be stewards of this precious resource. And we believe our mice is, are indeed precious resource for biomedical science. So much so that the ex-president of Princeton University, Shirley Tillman, who is a scientist in her own right, a wonderful scientist, said um, that if there is a blackout in Bar Harbor, there's a brownout in American science. So you can imagine what happened when there was a fire here uh, before. Now, um, uh, you know, I guess fast forward to what we have today is I certainly hope, I was really quite um, uh, reassured by Kevin, Kevin that this fire was once in a life, not once in an eon um, uh, experience. So, you know, in my tenure as president, I feel very comfortable that I, I don't have to do what Ken Pagan did. Let me give you an, uh, a story about Ken. He wasn't even president at the time that this fire occurred. He was actually uh, um, finishing looking at a job to be the president here. The fire occurred as he was taking a car to the airport to go back to California, to UC Berkeley, where he was a professor. Now, he could have walked away from this. He, nothing was, was complete. He didn't. And this is the type of commitment the scientists have to this place because it is so, so important. Um, uh, to, to all of us. On a personal level, I live in Bar Harbor. I live right off Hancock, right before the little um, uh, path to the shore path. And it, it happens to be um, um, Beatrice, Beatrice Farron's uh, estate. And uh, of the houses that were left there, there was only one house left after the fire. And it was the gardener's cottage. And that's where I live. And, uh, he, the gardener had a great gig. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but, but it's really fantastic. And to live in that piece of history in Bar Harbor, to me, is very special. And very special to hear the, the, current, the stories that you've had. Now, um, I'm sure our, our, our speakers would love to answer some of the questions from the audience. So may I ask our speakers to step up um, and open this evening to uh, to questions from from the audience so. this is being recorded so if you have the question raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone over please okay. sir oh god <laughs> okay. uh, by the way if you don't mind just uh, state your name and uh, 
So there yes, you know. uh, my name is Bill Horner. Um, this is more of a augmentation of my friend Jack's uh, talk. Um, I came here as a newly minted general surgeon in 1972 and was being given a tour of the local hospital and we went down to the blood bank and I said well how many pints of blood do you keep on hand here and my partner Lou Cooper whom you all remember probably said oh just a couple and I said well what do you do in a pinch he said we call Alan Salisbury. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Salisbury organized the core of hot blood donors from the Jackson Lab, and I dare say the 4,500 figure that you quoted for the number of years you tallied had uh, only approximate the number of units of blood that came out of the Jackson <laughs> Laboratory well, thank you, over Bill. that period of time. So we're. That's a great community con uh, connection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a, what a great piece of history. Uh, there's a question. Hi, Ted Brummage. Uh, this is for Kevin. We moved here full time where our house was finished 22 years ago. At that time, I can remember the park's attitudes on views and things like that is we preserve. and. I sense, and we were down at the Maine Historical Society looking at how these plans all came together, that Rockefeller gave us the parks, pretty much of it, with views. And at what point did it change from letting trees grow to maintaining the gift that was given to the, the country? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the, the Acadia National Park is this incredible landscape, and it's really known as being a landscape architecture kind of park that was really designed uh, very carefully so that it would be this spectacular, to provide these spectacular vistas and that you know everything from the roads to the carriage road bridges to the bridges along the motor roads were designed very carefully to blend in with this landscape and to, and to, look, to look gorgeous. And so today, you know, they, you still have that and that's really part of our mission is to preserve that legacy. And so we've actually gone through and identified which are those historic vistas that we want to maintain into the future? And there are many throughout the park, uh, along the carriage roads and also along our motor roads. And so, you know, if left untreated, trees will go pretty quickly here, as 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 we can see. Uh, but but you know, at some point, and I'm not sure when we started really maintaining those those vistas, uh, so that you know you do have these these wonderful views. But you know, there's a balance between trying to sort of have every section of every road be cleared for, for vistas. We couldn't keep up with that. But maintaining the most important that have historic integrity and that were intentional based on the design of the roads and the, and the, um, and the system. The one thing that's come to me is, hey, Ted, you better look over there because there's a view that you didn't see two years ago. And I think that's the impressive thing. You drive around and you know what's there. We really don't know until we look. And every time you do that, you get a greater appreciation of where we are. Thank you. It's Thank great. you. Laura. Uh, yes, Frank Zito. Could you give us a little information on the, the housekeeping and lodging details for one and a half million mice? <laughs> uh, and is there a, maybe a link you can go on and look on? It's fascinating to be able to take care of that many animals. Yeah, it? um, it's quite complex. I, I think you will find that the reason why it costs uh, one point, uh, a hundred, probably $150 million for us to set up a whole new facility in, uh, in Ellsworth is because this is like a space capsule. You know, they're actually more protected than any hospital room you'll ever have. Um, and um, the major reason is that uh, in order to have consistent results, the mice have to be uh, free of certain uh, pathogens, um, and um, uh, and because these these infections will change considerably the results of of the experimentation, among other things, including the health and welfare of the animals. So, to give you an example, uh, because of this kind of prevention of contagion, um, our facilities, which is by the way among the best in the world. Uh, have only one-way flow of samples. There's um, food and bedding is autoclaved. 
Um, the food is specially designed by over the years. We have a, an idea of what is the best for the, uh, for the mice. Um, and we work with uh, Purina and other provi providers to, to do that. The bedding has to be of a specific um, wood type. Um, I'm told that if you use pine, the, um, the, the sap from the pine actually causes, it's actually an environmental issue that changes the health of the, of, of the animals as well. So these things have always been, all been, um, been um, optimized. And then you fast forward into the, in the rooms, um, uh, they have uh, cages that have um, a, a, a food and water um, done in a, uh, in a special uh, way. Um, and the bedding has to be changed on a routine basis as well. Um, the breeding is done in a separate um, area and then um, uh, weaning takes place. And um, the, here's the thing, you can't ship mice from outside in and expect it to come in. That, that, that's not allowable because of contagion. So there are actually um, a special building where they're holding room uh, facilities where the transfer of these mice are actually done in, a, um, in some of the manner that Jill talked about. Just to give you an example, you know, you, you know about in vitro fertilization. Um, um, it's more common nowadays uh, in terms of assisted reproduction. Jackson Labs does 70,000 IVFs, successful IVFs a year. 70,000. There is not one place in the world that has this kind of experience. And so, yeah, just show you. I mean, this is pretty special uh, institution. Sorry. Uh, Linda. I feel like a game show host. <laughs> How many paper clips do you got in your bag? Can I ask the question here? Hi, this is a question for Kevin. I'm wondering if the dead red pines along Sargent Drive in those mountains are considered a fire hazard by the Park Service? Well, they're certainly, they, they certainly uh, could burn. Uh, they're, they're uh, you know, I think it gets back to this issue of, uh, you know, it, that, that's a scope that's too large for us to mechanically thin. It wouldn't be sort of appropriate given our management policies and our management paradigm. Uh, but, you, you know, we're in a place that fortunately gets a lot of precipitation and, and uh, you know, we haven't seen large scale wildfires here um, really other than this exceptional event. And so, you know, should something get started, we would hope that we could be as well positioned as possible to suppress it uh, as quickly as we can. I mean, we have wildland fire starts every year in Acadia. You don't hear about them largely because they never get very large. They may be a tenth of an acre or, or a quarter of an acre at most, um, and we're able to, to suppress those immediately. So with any luck, we'd have the right conditions to be able to detect it. Uh, the good news is there are a lot of people around Acadia, and that's one of the things that can help us is, is uh, people report fires and, and let us know about, uh, about those kinds of things. But it's certainly something we're, we're aware of and, and we pay attention to. One to two more questions. One thing. I'm Marshall Smith. Uh, in 1947, I was a teenager vacationing on Newberry Neck in Surrey. and. In August of that year, a group of us came over to Mount Desert Island and drove around Bar Harbor, uh, finding ways to visit some of these fancy estates. <laughs> came back the next summer, and they were all gone. Mm. And I was talking to a friend on Newberry Neck who was watching the fire, and her story was that she said it started on one side of Cadillac, went up and over the top of the mountain, and down the other side, in 15 minutes. Does that sound reasonable? Well, uh, it certainly started in Dolliver's Dump uh, over the week span. Um, but uh, the speed with which the fire moved, particularly on the afternoon of the 23rd, was extraordinary. Six miles in three hours. And I have an image in my mind of looking back from the Trenton Bridge and seeing uh, the fire on part of Sargent and essentially all of Cadillac uh, moving very quickly. And it got from the, the flanks of the town to Jack's in probably half an hour. Uh, it was a, a fire driven by 60 mile an hour winds, goes through the crowns uh, and shoots forward. You know, it's, it can drop down and start burning uh, the duff off of everything. But it, you know, I, I think that the two weather events that Kevin referred to are six months of drought and then gale force winds of a sustained kind 
uh, at peak vulnerability. But you know, many people report not just from Newberry Neck, but all up and down the coast. I mean, people from other states seeing uh, the volume of smoke in the air. Uh, it's something that people of our age remember. Yeah. Perhaps one more, one more question, and we can. Uh, is that? I'm Felicia Wiswell. Sorry. Yes, please. Uh, this is for Jill. I don't think most of us realize what you have to go through and how you have to keep on top of things and looking in the future for Bar Harbor and the island. But one problem I understand that the people have who come here to work, they can't find good places to live. Anything being done for that? <laughs> Well, um, I want to thank you all very much. We have a reception outside. I want to yet uh, again thank Heather Hodgkins, who's standing over there. For her. We really have a great development team, uh, Danny and all the others are outside. So please join us for some libation and food. Yeah.